Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage a representative from Mock Industries. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Merriam, and I'm here on behalf of Mock Industries. Um, we are a small defense startup uh, out of Huntington Beach, California, and we are part of that uh, new emerging constellation of defense tech companies that is uh, set out to try and uh, revolutionize the U.S. defense industrial base um, and make a meaningful and immediate contribution um, to our ability to deter war. And today, the focus of my talk is actually going to be about deterrence and how the kind of systems that Mach and others are building and fielding um, can hopefully continue to provide a credible deterrent so that we don't have to face um, that most horrible of scenarios. Uh, so here we are at the AI Expo. There are so many amazing uses um, for AI and, and the advanced technologies that our country's fielding. And you know, it doesn't always feel good to stand um, in front of these rather evil looking uh, weapon systems um, because we all want to imagine a bright future where we're using AI for everything but war. But we live in a, a world, uh, unfortunately, we're cursed to live in one that is um, uh, in the midst of great power competition. And we can't ignore the the possibility that that competition tips over into war. Um, before I joined Mock Industries, I spent 25 years as a soldier in the United States Army. And so I share uh, that conviction that most old soldiers share, which is that war is an absolute horror that must be avoided if, we can, if it can be. Um, but the best way we view um, to, to avoid war is to deter it. And so that's what I want to focus on today. Deterrence. Um, we're going to talk about what composes deterrence, but in the modern age, you know, we are we are faced with a sort of tipping point in how countries are preparing for war. All right, there are the long history of military innovation and conflict shows that we are always in sort of a move counter move a situation of continuous adaptation, from the stirrup to GPS to the internet. You know, technologies are constantly being advanced that will enhance the ability of one country or another. Uh, to wage war, and others fight to keep up with that. Well, we have emerged um, into an age where autonomous systems are the next step in that adaptive process. And it is our thesis that actually autonomous systems provide a kind of deterrent that other platforms have not in the past, uh, a much more uh, powerful and persuasive deterrent. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about why that is. The kind of things we're building here um, that we're looking at across the world are cheap, they're scalable, they're effective, they're reliable. They use base technologies that are not terribly advanced, right? but that if perfected, can radically increase the scale, uh, the disbursement, uh, the effectiveness of our forces. Suddenly, small forces become capable of facing large ones, um, and we, at the same time, develop an ability to take the enemy's counterpunch and survive it. So autonomous systems provide deterrence in a new way that our legacy systems, boutique, incredibly effective and powerful, but uh, expensive and rare, do not. We woke up yesterday morning to this sort of shocking headline, right? Ukraine just destroyed something like $7 billion worth of Russia's strategic bombing capability with a, uh, a couple hundred first-person drone quadcopters, right? Ingenuity. Um, and scalability that is almost impossible to fathom. So the strategic nuclear deterrent of Russia took a punch uh, from autonomous drones thousands of miles away from those who programmed them that were not operating under human control at the time they struck. So if that's not deterrence, I don't know what is, because you have a nuclear power faced with a small neighbor and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with it in a struggle that it never imagined would last as long as it has. The reason autonomous systems provide a kind of deterrence that other conventional systems don't has to do with how we actually measure deterrence. The way they teach us in war college is that deterrence is a simple formula. All right? It is capability times will. And the fact that that's multiplication is very important because anything times zero is zero. So it's not enough to have the capability. You've also got to have the will. And traditionally, those in the defense industry have been focused on providing capability. Right? Will is the province of the statesman. It's the statesman who's got to decide carefully how to communicate intent, how to deter without provoking, how to decide what capabilities to reveal and what to conceal. 
And so the defense industry has been focused on equipping the nation with the tools it needs, leaving the idea of will to those who determine our political future. Autonomy changes this equation, though, and I want to tell you why. Suddenly, with autonomous weapons, we see the ability to both deliver standoff uh, effects in a distributed way. Um, both of those two things serve to protect the lives of our warfighters. At the same time, we retain the ability to be precise and discriminate, which limits the effects of war on civilians and other non-combatants. And it's the autonomous guidance systems in these weapons that allow us to do that, to both preserve the lives of our soldiers and retain our precision edge and our ability to be discriminate as we fight. So to an authoritarian adversary, it's always been pretty clear how to erode US will to fight, impose casualties, and raise the sort of prospect of the horror of war, uh, causing your population to want to withdraw from it. So for the first time with autonomous systems, the designers and makers of our weapon systems can actually contribute to projecting that will to fight. Because we can credibly say the United States people are more likely to sustain a long fight with an adversary when they know we can be precise and discriminate and distribute our forces in a way that protects their lives. So the design and execution of fielding autonomous systems can actually make a, a direct contribution to persuading an adversary that the US will will not erode. And I think this is the first time we've seen that in a category of weapon systems. So we are trying to connect directly what Mach is building to the idea of deterrence. The whole goal of building tens of thousands of scalable, cheap, effective, low-cost systems is so that we don't have to use them. But if we can credibly persuade an adversary that if pushed, we would, we achieve that deterrent effect that we're looking for. As we develop autonomous systems, though, we've got to be mindful of the, the risks. All right? The risks on the ethical and legal uh, side of the equation are very real, and we've got to just confront them squarely. Uh, we woke up this, yesterday morning to this headline, which, again, is about as frightening a thing as you can imagine, particularly uh, if somehow you've made uh, that AI system uh, have control over weapon systems. So we've got to adhere to principles of responsible AI, uh, we've got to conform strictly with the DOD's uh, directives on autonomous weapon systems uh, and always, always ensure that appropriate human judgment can be exercised with the decision to use lethal force. None of the th systems that we're fielding, none of the systems that you see uh, other members of this defense um, tech constellation are fielding are, are designed to make decisions on their own to take lives. All right? What is autonomous about them is how they implement the instructions given by human beings. But those human beings retain that appropriate level of judgment over that critical, ethical, legal decision. And so as we build these systems, we have to make sure we are building them transparently so that the operators, the commanders in the field, don't just understand the effects they can achieve, but actually understand how they work, right? How they work so that they understand where they might fail and when their use might not be appropriate. So what Mach has done is try to incorporate those ethical and legal considerations into the design phase of what we're doing. In fact, my job at Mach exists solely because of those considerations. I spent 25 years in the Army. Uh, I spent 20 of them as a lawyer working on uh, law of armed conflict compliance. And so Mach brought me on board to help make sure that as we build these systems, we are factoring in our legal obligations to be discriminate and to avoid inflicting unnecessary suffering, and our ethical commitment to having responsible, transparent, and accountable use cases for our AI. So, this is all what we see as the sort of cutting edge of AI and autonomous weapon systems going into the future. Um, but the last thing is that the, the use cases for AI in the defense industry are not simply the weapons themselves. Uh, we are transforming how we make them. Because again, to compete with authoritarian adversaries who right now own advantages in mass and manufacturing scale, we've got to close that gap. All right, so we can't afford to have everything we build cost, you know, the GDP of a small country. We've got to ensure we are building things that are rapidly scalable, uh, easy to design, easy to distribute manufacturing across the country. So what Mach is doing is created um, a network of distributed manufacturing facilities, each one of which may have a small output on its own, but when aggregated, produce these uh, systems at scale. Uh, the idea is to have entirely local supply chains, uh, distributed manufacturing facilities that if war breaks out, um, 
that defense industrial base would survive first contact with the enemy. Again, we view this as a deterrent. The hope is that war never breaks out because our adversaries see that we're capable of fielding really effective systems uh, using cutting edge technology, but we're able to do it at scale and at low cost. So the good news of this uh, sort of, I, I suppose, grim story is that um, we have never yet seen uh, innovation in the defense arena that did not lead to directly uh, transformative use cases in, in civilian life in the rest of our lives, right? I mean, the pressure to innovate that is produced by strategic competition, competition is intense and it forces that rapid innovation because it's literally existential. And then history has shown over and over again, we discover that the use cases for these things go on for decades, right? So everything again, from radar to GPS to the internet, these things were created under the pressure of defense-driven innovation, and then they radically transformed the lives of citizens of all countries around the world. AI is gonna be no different. AI did not emerge out of the defense industry, but it is gonna have use cases that come from defense innovation that are going to transform the world in ways we don't yet see. And the fact that we don't yet see them should not deter us from pursuing them, because history is a pretty good guide. We will find ways to use uh, a system designed to fly where you tell it to under incredibly uh, arduous environmental conditions uh, to deliver a weapon. And one day that same technology will be enabling it to, develop, to deliver humanitarian aid or to explore unmapped uh, territories, maybe on other planets. We just don't know. Um, but the, the idea is that defense innovation almost always produces civilian innovation that changes the way we live. So these are the ways that we think the, the defense tech startup community is pushing the envelope, trying to drive uh, our innovation forward in a way that deters our adversaries by showing that we can match them at scale, we can match their mass, we can out-innovate them, and we can do it responsibly by incorporating ethical and legal principles into the design of our autonomous systems. This is what Mock's about. I suspect this is what most of uh, the companies in that constellation are also interested in, um, because we all share that same goal of making sure we are the best equipped to fend off the prospect of great power war. The only thing that I can imagine that is worse than fighting a war against a peer adversary is losing a war against a peer adversary. And so we want to help ensure that that never comes to pass, because we have done um, what I think the American people expect us to do, which is out-innovate, out-produce, uh, and outthink our adversaries as we field these systems. So thank you very much for your time. I didn't have a robot dog. Uh, I have only these, ter terrifying, um, these terrifying UAVs up here for you to look at. But uh, I, I want to take this opportunity to engage in this uh, very serious topic. Um, you're a serious bunch of people. This is a, a, a serious moment in our history. And so we want to make sure that we address it appropriately. So with that, I thank you very much. And uh, I'll open the floor to questions.